start the discussion, I would like to uh, give first the floor to our great partner, uh, David Ibsen, who is uh, Executive Director of the County Extremism Project and who is joining us, I believe, from New York. Hi, David. Hey, Elena, how are you? Uh, greetings from New York to everybody. Um, it's great to great to join you. Welcome you here to this discussion. Um, as Elena mentioned, my name is David Ibsen. I'm the direct, uh, executive director of the Counter Extremism Project, a proud uh, partner organization uh, of GlobeSec. Um, uh, the reason uh, that I'm here is to welcome you to uh, this specific side event at the forum, uh, where we're going to uh, announce and introduce uh, the second in a series of reports um, that we've produced uh, in partnership with GlobeSec on the presence and activities of the Muslim Brotherhood in uh, Central uh, and Eastern uh, Europe. As mentioned, this is the second in a series of reports um, that we've undertaken, uh, that GlobeSec really has undertaken with the support, the proud support uh, of CEP. The first report, which I encourage you all uh, to review if you haven't already, is more of an overview, um, a general kind of survey of uh, MB activities in the region. Um, this second report drills down a little more and focuses on the specific analysis uh, and results of research undertaken by the GlobeSec team in three specific countries uh, in the region, namely the Czech Republic, Poland, uh, and, and Serbia. And we're very fortunate to have um, a group of researchers, very distinguished, knowledgeable group of researchers uh, here today to uh, present and, and discuss uh, on those findings. Uh, just with your indulgence, a little bit about uh, CEP for those of you who aren't uh, familiar. Um, CEP is a transatlantic research and advocacy organization, and we work to disrupt the activities of extremist and terrorist groups really across the, the spectrum, um, from Islamist terrorism on one hand to uh, extreme left-wing, extreme right-wing terrorism uh, on the other. Uh, in particular, we have an expertise in the area of extremist misuse uh, uh, of the internet. And by that, I mean how extremist terrorist groups uh, misuse uh, leverage, exploit uh, the internet and social media services to recruit, incite, propagandize. Uh, in addition to our work in this online space, uh, we also focus on uh, the financial networks, financial activities of extremists and terrorist groups, mainly how they uh, raise funds, how they transfer funds, how they store assets, uh, and how we can pressure and disrupt those networks. Of course, we also work in generally in the CBE, PBE space, uh, most recently, lately, with a focus on the reintegration, rehabilitation of uh, convicted terrorist uh, offenders. Um, all of our work in that area is available on our website at counterextremism.com. Um, analysis, uh, research into extremist ideologies, groups, leaders, as well as our um, uh, sponsored reports that we've done uh, with GlobeSec, not just in this area, the Muslim Brotherhood and CEE, but previous reports that we've uh, supported GlobeSec team and putting together on the pathways to radicalization. All that is available on our website and I encourage everyone to, uh, to give it a read. Um, we work here in New York, but also with activities in, in Brussels uh, and Berlin. Our Brussels team is led by Lucinda Creighton, who I believe is appearing on a, a panel at the, the forum tomorrow on digital sovereignty. So it's another chance for everyone to be reacquainted or reintroduced or introduced um, uh, to CEP. Um, um, so with that, I'd like to thank Again, uh, GlobeSec for the, um, the great partnership. I'd like to thank them for the opportunity to introduce this, this panel. Uh, great congratulations on yet another um, fantastic forum uh, of all the groups really in the world. I think the one that most people would expect to be able to pull off a multi-day conference, multi-platform conference in this very, very challenging environment, it would be GlobeSec. Um, so you didn't disappoint at all. Uh, very, very happy for you all. Thanks to, to Casper and to Victor and Elena and Andrea, and, uh, Andrea for, for their good partnership in this work. So i um, happy to hand it back to you, Elena, and um, uh, look forward to this very interesting um, and exciting discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, David, also for your very kind words about uh, the GlobSec as an organization and the conference. We definitely miss you in Bratislava, uh, but happy that you woke up this morning to be with us from New York. So thank you very much for that. We did, we're indeed very proud of our partnership with the Council Extremist Project that we've enjoyed for the past two years. So we hope that we have yet another series of very successful research activities and presentation. So uh, uh, David already introduced briefly what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to look at the cases of uh, Muslim Brotherhood activities in three countries. In total, there will be five countries that we're studying within this project with the kind support of the country extremism project. But today we will just focus on the three of them. We're going to look at the Czech Republic, Poland, and Serbia. 
And uh, uh, first, I'm going to my colleague, Victor Such, who is going to take the first case, and that is the Czech Republic. Victor is the program manager and research fellow within the National Security Program at the Global Policy Institute. He focuses on challenges related to the changing European security environments. Victor's project study Muslim Brotherhood in Central and Eastern Europe, Jihadi terrorism trends in Europe, or a counter on terrorism financing with international cooperation of financial intelligence units. Victor, you're next. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll just like to thank everybody who joined us either here in person as well as virtually. Uh, so as Alain has said, uh, I'll be talking about the Czech Republic, but before we jump into the findings of the Czech Republic, I would like to uh, first in a few slides briefly explain how we conduct our research and what indicators we were following. If you permit me, let me just share my screen and uh, also my presentation. So, and perhaps before I even uh, start the presentation, I would like to clarify one thing in an image uh, that you see either on the publication or on my slide, which is of a Muslim man crying. And by no means we're trying to insinuate that this person is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. It was simply a stock photo that we've chosen to use um, in, on our publication, sort of hinting at the nature of the Muslim Brotherhood, how um, secretive, secretive this group is and how they're trying to blend in among the Muslim population and appear as a moderate movement, which is something uh, that has been a, an interesting, uh, um, I would say, matter to follow in this research. So the methodology, um, general methodology focuses on five countries, Czech Republic, Poland, Serbia, North Macedonia, and Bosnia Herzegovina. And as has been already said, uh, this report that we, are, we have published on, some, on our website, but you can also uh, grab a copy of it here, is um, focusing on the first three countries mentioned. Um, so we know we want to find the Muslim Brotherhood, but how do we do that? In what communities do we look for the, for the Brotherhood? Um, and almost all study countries have indigenous Muslim uh, communities, except the Czech Republic. But these communities practice strands of Islam, which have been intertwining with the respective countries and local cultures for centuries and are not favored by the Islamists. And in the CEE context, uh, it makes sense to us to look for them among the expatriates, converts, and converts, um, because these are the communities we would expect them to be. So the Czech Republic has only these communities. Poland's expatriate and convert community is actually larger than the indigenous Tatar community. Uh, Serbia has around 200,000 of uh, converts and experts concentrated in Belgrade. North Macedonia doesn't have a sizable expat community, um, but we know its indigenous community struggles to keep revivalist imams away from its mosques. So we need to take a different approach in this case. And lastly, but not least, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is a control case. Here we're trying to see if there is any room for Islamists within a Muslim majority European country. The last factor that helped us choose these five countries is the representation of the Muslim communities vis-a-vis -vis the state. Czech Republic and Poland don't have any national Muslim organizations. They do have Muslim organizations, but none of them are recognized as national by the state. Uh, Serbia has one uh, which is dominated by Bosnians, which has in, in effect caused a rival group to form. So we have a state of competition. And lastly, North Macedonia and Bosnia have their unitary Muslim organizations. Uh, although the North Macedonian had to uh, work hard to defend Muslim rights, uh, unlike the Bosnian. So we have different environments there. So all in all, we have a wide spectrum of environments that represent different settings for the Muslim brothers to operate in. And we're curious to see how different they'll turn out to be for the Muslim brothers in, in effect. So we're not expecting just to find one kind of organization. Um, some groups will openly meet with Muslim Brotherhood representatives, but most won't. And is meeting a representative enough to say that the organization is influenced by the Muslim Brotherhood? Uh, we would say uh, no. Uh, that is why we look at the official, uh, official affiliation with Muslim Brotherhood federative bodies. Uh, that means being a member of the Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe, for example. And we def when defining this group back in May, we thought this would be enough as an, of an indicator to determine the link. Uh, however, our research 
uh, that will be presented today, we have found there are limits to it. And I'll explain this a little bit in more detail uh, when presenting the Czech case in a minute. The second label is more complex, but also more interesting um, because we do not rely on a black and white decision as in the first case, uh, first label with official affiliations. Here, tracking their activity is key to us. And this is uh, where I'll focus most of my presentation on later on. Um, so we determine their connections by analyzing a plethora of information, such as personal ties, funding, ideological support, and others. And the last label includes, includes groups for which there is evidence they can belong to the sphere of influence of the Muslim Brotherhood, but the data is insufficient or conflicting. Essentially, we use the same process for these groups as for the second label, uh, but when the findings are inconclusive, the, the group, the study group, or, or ends up in this third label. Now, now let me zoom in, zoom in on the check case. I have been studying in the last few months. So although the research team um, behind the publication each mapped out one country, we use the same methodology. And each researcher has conducted a variety of interviews to be organized in four groups. So we have experts from academia, government officials, members of Muslim communities, and voices in opposition to, to the study groups. In addition to the interviews, we have reviewed uh, primary sources, such as the group's official websites, publications, press releases, letters, and uh, other material that they publish. They also rely on reading secondary sources, including academic literature and news articles, for instance. So, permit me then to present the findings uh, in the Czech Republic in four major themes that we have written about in the report, documenting all indicators and explaining the state of the study today. The first indicate, indication are their formal connections to the pan European bodies set up by the Muslim Brotherhood that I mentioned before. The second are the various activities that we have been able to document and analyze in the given country context. Talking about context, we need to address the changing lens list on Muslim communities in the Central and Eastern Europe following the year 2015. And lastly, I shall present to you the present day situation of the study uh, organizations in the Czech Republic. So rather conveniently, actually, they follow a chronological path. So on the right side of your screen or on the screen, you will see a timeline with a brief high test note that depicts the general trends of the era. So let me start with the formal connections. The formal connections have been um, established in the early 1990s, since the political landscape has just shifted dramatically due to regime change in the Czech Republic. Some, mostly students, have seized the opportunity and started founding the first Islamic organizations and establishing memberships in the wider pan-European network, such as the Forum of the European Muslim Youth and Student Organizations, or FEMISO, or the Federation of Islamic Organizations in Europe, the FIO, that I already mentioned. So in the Czech Republic, we have seen a case, such cases, uh, or cases of such memberships. But looking further into the activities of the General Union of Muslim Students that was set up in the early 1990s, we quickly find out that this is an old organization that has not that has actually been absorbed into a larger one. And while speaking about the General Union of Muslim Students in the Czech Republic, it is worth to mention it was founded by Muhammad Abbas, who, a person who has later been retired from that organization once it was absorbed by the Islamic Foundation in Prague. Um, so he later in 2000 founded another organization. He called it the organization the Muslim Union and he registered it at the FIOP. This organization, however, is a much smaller one and quite peripheral uh, to represent Muslims in the Czech Republic, which would be a primary goal or one of the primary goals of any Muslim brotherhood inspired organizations to be able to represent that community. Hence, formal connections have proved useful as a starting point, starting point for our analysis. Um, however, due to the fact that the decision to be members of the FIOE or FEMISO uh, have been made years ago by leaders who have been ousted or changed in the organizations, and the organizations themselves have not really been active in the federations later on, simply could not be enough of evidence of a linkage between these organizations and the Muslim Brotherhood. So now we move on to the 2000s. And whilst the organizations have been successfully registered as religious entities, uh, they were allowed to expand the range of their activities. And this is the slide I want to focus most of our time on. Um, so in the Czech Republic, we were looking at the Islamic Foundation in Prague, uh, its sister organization in Brno, 
uh, the Czech Republic's second largest city and the already mentioned Muslim Union. The Islamic organization in Prague, Foundation in Prague, has supported one text by the FIOD, a video by the Council on American Islamic Relations, which uh, Lorenzo Vidino flags as a Muslim Brotherhood linked organization in the United States. And in its electronic library, you may be able to find a book published by the World Assembly of Muslim Jews, WAMI, which is also being linked to the Muslim Brotherhood before. The Islamic Foundation in Bergen, in the sister organization, has written a letter to Yusuf Karadawi, an ideologue for the Muslim Brotherhood residing in Qatar, to help them facilitate connection to Palestine so they could uh, transfer funds to the people there. This happened back in 2001, and the rhetoric when the leader of this organization was confronted about it in media 11 years later, in 2012, was quite an interesting one because he said uh, verbatim, uh, Karadavi is a wise person uh, with whom he wants to be in touch, but that Zionists want him to cut his ties to him. Um, so the organization also distributes a six-year-old magazine, Al-Islam, that comes from their Slovak branch that has raised our attention because, for instance, the front page of this edition featured an article by Sumaya Ganushi uh, defending her father's party in Nahda in Indonesia, uh, which is thought to be the Muslim Brotherhood political party in that country. It must be said that the magazine is now six years old, and the fact that there is not a newer issue might hint at the possible financial issues this organization might be experiencing, or it might hint at the fact that they've been changing their publication uh, strategy or activities. And lastly, the Muslim Union is a tricky case because on one hand, its founder has showed support on social media for the former president of Egypt, uh, coming from the Muslim Brotherhood, Mohammed Morsi. And the union's publication called Muslim Letters have used the Rabia symbol on the Facebook page. But again, the publication has been discontinued and the um, opinions of the union's leader, Mr. Abbas, have been very controversial and covered well in the media. So to give an example, he was quoted saying a conspiracy theory that the so-called Islamic State was founded by the CIA. Uh, and he regularly posts uh, hoax articles coming from this information website on his Facebook. So as you might have noticed, the political sphere, another very important arena for the Muslim Brotherhood, is missing almost entirely, which takes me to the next point, which is the context. So the year 2015 was important from two perspectives. On one hand, Europe was affect, uh, affected by the so-called refugee crisis, and on the other, it suffered major attacks by ISIS. This has set the securitization of Muslims in motion, especially in the CBD region. Although these countries were not exposed to jihadist terrorism as the Western Europe, European countries were, they have started to adopt similar laws for arrest and prosecution of members of the terrorist groups. And the major focus one was on um, religiously motivated terrorism, namely jihadism. Uh, this threat was presented as pertaining to Islam as a religion by multiple media outlets and have intertwined the two phenomena together. Uh, terrorism and Islam as a religion. Protests against refugees ensued as this sporadic attack on mosques, and even the top political level has used rhetoric that can be portrayed as Islamophobic. All in all, there have been public and even criminal acts aimed at Muslim populations in the Czech Republic, which has had a strong effect on the organizations there. So, present, present day. So, today we can perceive a trend of looking inwards, meaning on the Muslim communities only with very, publication, uh, very little publication or outreach efforts. Um, the presence in the media is more limited to explaining the Muslim faith and trying to detach Islam from terrorism. Mostly the organizations are financially very much dependent on donors from abroad, and it seems the money they collect from the local community goes only so far as to maintain their premises and activities. Some organizations like the Islamic Foundation in Prague actually uh, refuse to disclose their finances publicly despite it being a direct obligation under the Czech law. And this opens doors to other actors from abroad who focus their efforts on building mosques, but are always, not always successful. So let me leave you uh, in conclusion with five big points. The formal connections to the Muslim Brotherhood and organizations in Europe and even beyond were found in the early stages of the development of the organizations analyzed in our report. However, currently these appear to be inoperative. There, have, there has not been detected any Dawa activity towards non-Muslims. What was noteworthy were online posts of images of successful conversions 
uh, in one Czech case, although the origin of these images is dubious or inconclusive. Finally, all publication activities have decreased dramatically. The groups surely try to advocate for Muslims and have, and to a certain degree, compete to represent this minority in the Czech Republic. However, these relationships with government institutions are gloomy at the moment because uh, of, and have been since the so-called refugee crisis of 2015. The current aim for the organization is to improve the position and perception of Muslims in the Czech Republic and further advance their financial backings to continue with the operation of their mosques, mosques and centers. And lastly, according to one expert interviewed on the situation in the Czech Republic, um, one trait of Muslim Brotherhood influence was visible during the Egyptian Revolution. At that time, Muslims from Prague and Brno were among members of the Brotherhood, who were, were um, yeah, among the members of the Brotherhood. However, this was not a well functioning group, as an internal split occurred, since some were supporting the then Minister of Defense, Abdel Fattah el Sisi, and others joined the protest against el Sisi after the military coup. Currently, these individuals have no time or energy and are suffering from cabin fever uh, because there are simply too few of them and the movement was not going anywhere by meeting the same people again and again. They belong to the younger generation and have a very different demeanor from the old leaders who preferred waiting the situation out. This inevitably frustrated the younger activists during the revolution and resulted in them setting up their own small organizations and groups apart from the Muslim brothers. Thank you very much for your attention, um, and I'll return the, the microphone, the virtual microphone. <laughs> the right to speak. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, ben was very insightful, and I'm just trying to keep track of all the stories that you're conveying here. Uh, first, uh, I'm, do you have any questions regarding the content of the presentation itself? We're going to have space later for discussing some of the ideas or conclusion, but now is the time to ask any questions in case something was unclear or uh, not logical from the presentation. No question? Perfect. So uh, thank you very much, Victor. All clear on that front. And we're going to move to the second presenter and the second country that we're examining today. And I want to invite uh, Katka Renkavik, who is our uh, external research fellow here at Globset. Uh, Kasper uh, is uh, also affiliated with the Council Extremism Project. And uh, from uh, 2016 and 2019, he uh, led our national security pro program here at Globset Policy Institute. Overall, he has more than 15 years of experience in counter extremism, prevention and counter and violent extremism, from academia work, from think tanks in the third sector, but also in the past he worked on the Irish Republican ter terrorism, jihadism and violent extreme rights wing. He is currently also involved in projects on the extremism foreign fighters who fought in the war in Ukraine. I'm giving the microphone to Kasper, who is going to present the Polish case to us. Thank you, Elena. Thanks a lot for having me. It's good to be back, even virtually. Uh, thank you to all who are here with us, either in the room, in the presidential suite, as the, the, the system is telling me that this is the presidential suite, and who are here with us uh, online. Uh, let me give you a quick overview of the situation in Poland vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, my presentation is just a bit less fancy than Victor's, but hopefully will also uh, will also uh, do the trick. Um, essentially, the situation, as you will see, is, is to, to some extent similar to the situation in Poland, is to some extent similar to the situation in the Czech Republic. There is, however, one massive difference, and this one massive difference is the fact that, as Victor outlined at the beginning, it, Poland does have an indigenous Muslim population. It's a small community of Polish Tatars, which has been in the country since, well, 17th century or 16th century to some extent. Uh, but it provides a certain backdrop to the situation uh, and an a interesting, let's say, focal point uh, of, our, of our discussion and research in the, in, the, in the process. So Victor kindly explained how we did our research and whom we talked to and how. Uh, so I will not, you know, waste time on this, but I'm happy to to go over this in the Q and A Q and A session. Uh, so let me just, you know, get straight to the point. So essentially, 
The title that I chose for this is Beggars Can't Be Choosers. And hopefully by the end of the presentation, you will know what I mean by this. Uh, maybe just one hint, one spoil, maybe one spoiler, if I may. It kind of tells you about the state of not only Islamist, but basically Muslim organizations in the country that to some extent, they are so strapped of, of money, connections, attention, etc., that at certain times they do bump into certain connections and then, then let's say uh, friends, inverted commas, which then at the end of the day might actually to some extent embarrass them. But the big question would be, do they have another choice? Which is obviously a kind of like a provocative question that I would leave, leave, you, leave you with towards the end of the presentation. But first off, you need to, th while thinking of this, you need to think about football. You know, Czech Republic doesn't have two communities, I would say, two Muslim communities in a way. Uh, Poland has at least two and maybe maybe more. If you actually see this slide, this is, you know, have, I'm not sure if you've ever been to Central Eastern Europe, you will know that the football matches, match some of the football matches, especially dar derby matches, meaning two teams from the same town, two teams from the same city, are pretty intense. And what is happening in Poland, in broadly speaking, in the Muslim, Muslim community, if I could put it this way, from an organizational point of view, is the fact that you do have two organizations competing with one another. And this is to symbolize this. These are the fans of two rival teams in my city of Łódź walking down the same street called Aleja Adama Mickiewicza, uh, walking to one stadium from, uh, you know, from one stadium to another uh, to actually attend the der derby game in the, in the given, in given city. I don't have to tell you that they really dislike one another. And to some extent, this is mirrored in the situation in the in the Muslim Muslim community Muslim community in Poland. So the first thing I want you to think about is football. Think about rivalry. Okay, there is a rivalry between football teams, and which is especially intense uh, when these two teams are from the same town and from the same city. So the first point I would like you to think of, while well, actually we're going to be discussing this, think about rivalry. I would like you to think about access. Think about an isolated. Islamic or, or isolated Muslim community in a post-communist country, which at the, you know, at the collapse of communism in 1989, is left with very little choices, is left with very little assets, and is left with very little contacts and channels to communicate to the broader, uh, broader let's say, Muslim, Muslim world. So think about access. I would also like you to think about connections. This very community in 1989 has very few connections. And to some extent, what happens later is, you know, haphazard in a way, it's not so preordained, it's not so clandestine, and it's not so high tech. You know, if you're thinking large conspiracies, which are consciously leading to the conclusion that certain people are members of a clandestine organization, Islamist, political, which wants to subvert uh, the political order, not only in the Middle East, but also anywhere, basically. Well, that's a slightly different thing in a country in a country like that, which I think Czech Republic suffered from the same from the same situation. And most of the countries that we covered in our research, uh, this is really really the case with them. Think about money. Think about this community, which, to some extent, you know, there was actually an article in the Guardian yesterday about the Islamophobia in Europe. And it mentioned that Poland has 20,000 Muslims. That I think is an understatement. There's at least twice as many Muslims in Poland with some people actually saying there's way, way, way more, but they're simply hiding. Uh, I'll, I won't you know, put, an, put a final number on it, but you're looking at a community which is deprived of financial resources, which is really doesn't have a track record of relying on any sort of old money because there is no old money in the Islamic, in the Muslim community in, in, in Poland or broadly speaking in Central, Central Eastern Europe. Well, we'll be discussing the case, think of growth and decline of organizations. We're gonna be looking mostly at two organizations and these two organizations, they have a tendency to, well, uh, of, you know, they, have a, they go through these periods of growth and decline and it's both of them, both of these rivals uh, have, have periods of, you know, when they fare better and when they fare worse. And this is something that we need to take into account while actually trying to establish whether there is an MB connection in the, in the country. And I think the last point, which touches upon tiredness, you know, after 2015 and after the rather remarkable campaign, let's be honest, targeting broader Muslim, Muslim communities around Europe, not just in the region and not, maybe not especially in the region, these organizations had to close ranks. Their activists were tired, their activists were targeted, their active, activists, as you know, they told me in interviews, they felt surveilled, 
they f they felt that each had a group of stalkers basically following them either online and in real life and they had problems actually re re reju rejuvenating those organizations in the aftermath of the of the migrant slash refugee crisis and the one slide that i've got on the actual what's been happening how the situation is looking in poland should should show should tell you it, it's basically all here so i'll walk you through these couple of points and we shall see how these connections were established and to some extent whether they were actually actually established so as i mentioned at the beginning you've got competition between two organizations and i'll just use shorthands i'll gladly use the full names in the q a session so you have the association which caters to the needs of the Muslim part, you know, the community of the Polish Tatars, this indigenous population that I mentioned at the beginning, theoretically rather small, but I don't, you know, there's probably more to this community than the between two to 3000 people who declare themselves as Tatars in the census of, of the Polish state. So that's not so small. Now the league is a younger kid on the block, a new, new kid on the block in inverted commas, which basically emerged from the association sometime in the 1990s and early 21st century. This is the organization that caters to the needs of the Muslim population of people who arrived in Poland, either in the 1980s as students or in the next decades and stay, have stayed over. And they dominate the leadership of the organization, but it would be unfair to say that there are no ethnic Poles uh, in, this, in, this, in this very group. And it is the latter, the league, which stands accused of being a front by some people of the Muslim Brotherhood in Poland, or at least having strong, vibrant ties with the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood Central, if I, could, if I could put it this way. But imagine that these organizations basically come of age and come to the fore in the 1990s, when you've got a situation in which in the country you've got very few Arabic speakers, and you're looking for a desperate way to link yourself up to basically mainstream Islam. Uh, to the Islam of the MENA region, to the Islam of the Gulf, to the Islam of, for example, Saudi Arabia, of many, 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 many uh, other places. And you cannot really do it because no one in your community actually speaks the language. This is why the activists who come in in the, in the 80s and in the 90s and then form the League are so useful to the community because they come in from these countries, they have certain connections back to their home countries, and they can link up the original association to the broader MENA is the Muslim opinion, Muslim body of thought, and then, 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 then leadership, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point, these organizations part their ways. I mean, it's only natural. The Tatar Association, so to speak, it's a conservative association, but conservative not in the sense of a conservative Muslim organization, but conservative in terms of being, you know, as a part of a Polish, Polish, Polish society. Probably someone coming from the MENA region, and I'll be diplomatic here, would be shell-shocked with certain cultural practices uh, of the Polish Tatars, which are more in line with the Polish Catholics than with the cultural practices of the, of the Muslims from the MENA, MENA region. And here comes the parting of the ways. You know, the new activists, the students who start off their own student association called the uh, Association of the Muslim Students in Poland, they start off, this is the nascent league. This is the, basically the organization for the new, newly arriving, arriving Muslims in the country who are looking for new connections, who are saying the association is old school, the association is traditional, it doesn't cater to our needs. It's some kind of cocooned form of Islam from 19th or 20th century, which doesn't suit us. We need to move on. We're looking for new, new things. We're looking for new connections. We know the language. We know the people in the MENA region, we know the people in, in our host countries, and these would be people coming from places like Iraq, uh, Libya, Syria, so sometimes quite very well connected to the epicenters of Islamic thought, let's put it, uh, let's put it this way, and they pave the way for the, for the new connections. And when you do establish these new connections, the League does, it actually runs into, you know, it runs into certain situations which nowadays are a source of embarrassment to the league. Because in the early 21st century, if you were trying to link up and join up with organizations like the FIOE, which is the alleged M Muslim Brotherhood Front in Western Europe, in the early 21st century, it, co it did have certain baggage, I could put it this way, when you were connecting with them. But at the same time, it was these were completely different times in terms of the functioning of the organization in the country. These were times from before the migrant crisis, from before the outbreak of what people quite often, uh, quite often rightly or wrongly say, this outbreak of, of, of Islamophobia. 
And this, these organizations see these connections as something, you know, clear cut as something not to be worried about. That basically this is a chance for them to network with the some sort of mainstream body of Muslim opinion, rightly or wrongly again. And at the same time, this is a chance for them to actually obtain funds. Let's not forget this. These two organizations are cash strapped from the, from the get go. As much as the association relies on the help of what is called the ambassadorial council of, of, of Muslim countries. So basically group of you know, ambassadors from Muslim countries accredited to Poland who spent their own embassies money and connect them to players in their own countries so that the association can uh, fundraise. The league to some extent positions itself on a completely different, on a, at least on a completely different, different keel as it says, we're gonna go directly to the people who are there in the West who will help us with whom we will liaise, with whom we will associate ourselves, and who will, you know, help us find sponsors who are not, you know, not to be found back in Poland, but they're to be found uh, internationally. Yet at the same time, they turn around and present themselves to the ambassadors, you know, and the ambassadorial council is an influential body that, I mean, looks after inverted commas, the Muslim in, Muslims in Poland. And they say, look, we are more like you, then the association. The association is this old Islam for the Tatars. We are just like you. We're Syrians, we're Egyptians, we're, we're, we're from the Gulf. You should be helping us. You should be helping, you know, you should be sponsoring us and you should be putting us with, in touch with, with certain people. And, you know, the point that I've got there, actions have consequences. You know, this releases a certain trend of connections with which the, the league is now embarrassed, you know, the league is now embarrassed with. Because its members sat on, on, body, you know, on the boards of bodies affiliated with the FIOE. Uh, the organization is, has been, you know, they're, they're cagey about that, affiliated with the FIOE. The organization is structured to some extent like the MB fronts uh, in Western Europe, and yet it still maintains it has nothing, nothing to do with that. The organization published, for example, books by the uh, Supreme Guides of the, of the, of the MB. The organization finally engages in acts of political activism, which could be interpreted as elements of being in favor, in favor of, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Brotherhood in Egypt. And I think actions have consequences, you know, final point on this, very, on this very issue. In 2013, the League was involved in protests outside the Egyptian embassy back in Warsaw, where it was actually protesting the, the downfall, the removal of President Morsi, uh, Morsi in the country. And afterwards, the organization lost a lot of its friends back in the country. Amongst them was this ambassadorial council, which said, oh, hang on. If you are actually supporting the Muslim Brotherhood government in, in Egypt, that comes at a price because we, we are not going to continue being your friends. We're not going to continue connecting you to, the, uh, to our friends back in the Gulf or in the, in, the, in the MENA region. At the same time, the organization embarks the league embarks upon a very ambitious project of constructing its own cultural center, cultural or Muslim center in Western part of Warsaw. And unfortunately this to a large extent, I wouldn't say bankrupts them, but it takes so much of their power. It takes so much of their money that it only perpetrates the vicious circle. The organization is more cash strapped, is looking for more sources of funding. It's desperate in this sense. At the same time, the association, this old school, uh, Association for the Tatars of Poland is also undergoing severe financial problems as it suffers a split. Uh, and I can get to that in the Q&A session. It's also about money, who basically controls the halal certification in the country uh, and whose family controls that. The organization splits. And again, it basically finds itself back to, you know, back in square, back to square one, where it really literally has to go around with, you know, cap in hand, asking for donations to maintain its mosques cultural centers and basically cater to the needs of the growing community. And to some extent that leads this organization to some interesting, you know, new friendships, if I, if I could put it this way, for example, with the Turkish Dianet, which is also stands accused of basically being, if Turkey is run by the Turkish Muslim Brotherhood, then Dianet is by uh, association in a sense, an arm of this, of this very organization. And now you have those Tatars who seemingly had nothing to do with any sort of Islamism, had nothing to do with any, any so forms of activism of, or politiz politicization, now suddenly basically doing projects, infrastructural projects, not only infrastructural projects, but so many other projects, which are financed by the Turkish, uh, Turkish Dianet. Then again, if this means they are Muslim Brotherhood, then obviously it could mean that the League had been the Muslim Brotherhood as well. So 
What I'm trying to say is that the beggars cannot be choosers in a way that if you're cash strapped, if you're looking for connections, if you're looking for space to grow, if you're looking for room to grow and for room to maneuver, at certain times, you will find yourself sitting in a room with people whom, if we were to do this research less rigorously, we'd probably call them outright Muslim Brotherhood. But in a sense, I'm yet to find, you know, the kind of clear cut, uh, clear cut, uh, clear cut activists. And, you know, one interviewee of mine said that it's easier to, it's easier to find uh, Muslim gays in Poland uh, in a relatively small community than an outright Muslim Brotherhood supporter, uh, supporter or a member. So what I'm trying to say is that, is this, there are connections, there are histories, there are things that are happening, that were happening there, that are probably, that are embarrassing and shameful, but what I would say, there is no master conspiracy, and quite a lot of what we see, either these links with Dianet, or the links with the, with the, uh, all sorts of actors from the past on behalf of the League, I would say, they, yes, I'm finishing up, finishing up now, uh, they, they are the result of the fact that, as I said at the beginning, beggars cannot be choosers. Thank you. Oh, sir. Okay, just, you're, you're disappearing. Yes, hello. Sorry, you disappeared for a little bit and you stopped with the conspiracies. That's oh, yeah, I stopped at the Look, so I'm trying to say that there is no master conspiracy. And quite a lot of what we came up with and quite a lot of what we uncovered, which I think is pretty embarrassing. And then, then to these organizations, and then puts a lot of question marks as to how they are led and how they are organized. Uh, it's not down to the fact that there is a master con conspiracy of I want to be a member of a Muslim Brotherhood or I want my organization to be a member of members of the Muslim Brotherhood globally. It's the result of the fact that beggars cannot be choosers. We don't have money, we don't have access, we don't have connections, yet we want to cater to the needs of our community. Uh, in terms of mosques, cultural centers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we somehow have to do it. And since there is no other, you know, quite, quite often there are no other sources of funding forthcoming, we will go cap in hand almost to anyone. And oops, sometimes this anyone, well, is connected to, to, to the organizations that are at the heart of the study uh, of, this, of, this, of this very pro uh, project. So to some extent, this is a mirror image of the Czech case, but the difference is that it's basically divided into two. So you are looking at two groups, two organizations, which are to a large extent trying to find their feet. And if you were to really scrupulously, like we did, look at their connections, then you could, you know, come, come away convinced that, you know, they both have links, they both have connections. But... Okay, so I think we lost Casper again, but as far as I understand, Casper was right now. No, it's, to say it's in the gray zone mission is very, very financially challenged in the, in, the, in, the, in the last couple of years. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Casper. Sorry for the little technical disturbance at the end, but I think we got the message very well. Are there any questions to Casper concerning this specific presentation? No. Oh, go ahead. Is it on? Okay. Yes. Hello, Casper. Uh, this is Adrian from the Institute for Security Policy in Kiel. Nice to see you in this way again. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I'm, I'm curious, um, why don't they have enough money out of the community? If I think normally back and how other community, religious communities normally grow and go ahead, this, the community will be funding uh, the kind of activities they want to be doing so that it comes out of the community and then grows naturally. That would be my one aspect. The second question I now took away that um, that this community from a, from a threat perspective, you never use the threat perspective, but probably from the mobilization or activ act activation um, ability due to the, the lack of cash to seem to be at the moment very low. And I wondered how much you mentioned the halal certification, uh, how much is, as some would argue also originally probably um, other religious organizations like the Catholic Church, how important is the commercial aspect here for this group? So are these people really uh, believing in what they're saying, what they're doing, or will they just play the song of whoever is uh, giving the money to them? And could that also be a way of 
getting into them in a great way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. Casper, uh, would you like to address that now or later in the off the record part? Mm, if you allow me, I'll fix my camera and I'll fix my internet connection. It's not that I have a problem with off the record. Uh, so if, if maybe you can allow me to push that to, to these questions to the Q&A later on, so that I'll have better connection and I'll be, you'll be able to hear me better. Okay, very good. So we're going to we have a question. I will remember about that. And while Casper uh, is working on the technical setup, we're going to go to Andre and Sergey. So Andre Marinkovic is going to present the Sergey case. Andre, hi Andre. Uh, Andre is our junior research fellow at the Glossic Policy Institute, working uh, with us since this summer on, on this specific project. Andrea is originally from the region, so she has the first hand view on many issues that are going on there. She holds the master's degree in global security from the Graduate Institute in Geneva, specializing in European and Asian security. A prior uh, to joining Blockset, Andrea worked at the United Nations University in Sofia. Andrea, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. If you would just give me one second to share my screen with you. Can you see everything? Yes. Perfect. So thank you, Elena, for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name is Andrea Marinkovic, and I will be briefly outlining the Serbia findings. So please, as Elena has instructed, save any questions that you might want me to elaborate on for the end of my presentation. Um, to start, allow me to set the scene by actually providing some background information on Islam in Serbia. The presence of Islam in Serbia is not a new occurrence. It actually dates back to the presence of the Ottoman Empire that was in the region for some 500 years. Currently, the population of Muslims in Serbia is approximately 3.2%, and that's some 200,000 people in total. Um, however, what's interesting in Serbia is that these Muslim populations are mainly socially distanced from the rest of the population because they are located in mainly in two specific regions of the country. So one in South Serbia, in the administrative Raška or the historical Sanjak uh, region, where you have two thirds of the Serbian Muslims who are mainly ethnically Bosniak, and also in the Preševo Valley where you have mainly ethnic Albanians. So in the past few decades, uh, Serbia's Muslim population has definitely seen some shifts initially starting with the ethnic wars in Bosnia and Kosovo and their spillover effect in the 1990s, but then also with some internal strife. So where Serbia differs from the previous two cases is that Serbia actually has two official Islamic communities, which have been in opposition since their inception, and we placed that around 2007. So you'll see on the left-hand side, the Islamic community in Serbia, and on the right-hand side, the Islamic community of Serbia. Their names are very close. But the rest of the table, I hope it gives you, gives you some insight in why they differ. So the main difference is actually seen in the third row. The Islamic community in Serbia is actually under the religious authority of the Bosnian Islamic community. And this is the case since the 1990s uh, that was caused with the breakup of Yugoslavia and then the issues that came with that. Uh, whereas the Islamic community of Serbia established in, in Belgrade in 2007 claims to be independent. And this is where their rift comes to place. But what is interesting about this is because they have been in conflict for the past decade and a bit longer, um, they have opened space for other external actors to come into the region and try to cater to the Muslims who do not feel supported by either one of these two communities. Um, on a larger scale, and when it comes to the relationship with the government, they have good, but primarily ceremonial relations. So for um, religious holidays and such occasions. Um, what our desk research and our interviews have shown is that unlike the two previous case studies, there have been no formal evidence of connections to the Muslim Brotherhood or Muslim Brotherhood affiliated groups. So the research has shown that the topic of the Muslim Brotherhood presence in Serbia is simply not that not of not particular interest. And some suggested that this might be the case because there are other groups that present a more pressing issue and in some cases even a threat. So although this is the case, there have been some indications uh, which we can call allegations uh, of potential connections to Muslim Brotherhood. And this is on the basis of a personal and professional connection 
between the former Islamic community in Serbia's Mufti Muamir Zukorlic and a prominent Bosnian figure, uh, the former Bosnian um, Grand Mufti Cerich. The connection here is on the basis of Cerich's uh, Muslim Brotherhood connections that are widely disputed, but still a source of allegations for this case. Uh, Cerich is uh, considered a member of Muslim Brotherhood affiliated organizations, such as the European Council for Fatwa and Research, and he's been seen at conferences that were supported by the Muslim Brotherhood and in presence of other Muslim Brotherhood members, such as Yusuf Karadawi. However, this evidence did not go further than these potential allegations and all of it remains at a circumstantial level. When we asked why this might be the case and why there is no Muslim Brotherhood presence in Serbia, uh, it was important to reflect on the wider context of what was happening in the country and in the region. The position of Muslims in Serbia has gotten worse over the years, as was the case in the both um, previous case studies. So there has been an increase in Islamophobia and also uh, securitization of the Muslim populations. Um, these events come hand in hand with global developments, such as the migrant crisis and the uh, terrorist attacks in Western Europe. However, there is a very important factor in Serbia that is due to the historical developments that we had to take into consideration. So when it comes to Islamophobia, um, when, it, when we're looking at it in terms of the autochthonous population in Serbia, um, it differs from that that is um, actually uh, manifested uh, in comparison to the migrants. So when it comes to the autochthonous population, the primary factor of discrimination is ethnicity rather than religion, although the two come coupled often. And um, that's been very prominent in the media um, where, and here you can see some newspaper uh, titles and articles, and I will not translate them, but basically what they're saying is they're calling the uh, national minority of Albanians uh, derogatory names. They're uh, describing the uh, situation with incoming migrants as a migrant tsunami. So there is a certain degree of securitization, and all of this is significantly harming the Muslim population in Serbia. Um, securitization is another factor, and I'll highlight two factors that are pretty interesting in this case again, being uh, split according to the two different populations. So you have the increased uh, securitization that is occurring during to the, the migrant crisis. Um, the media and the political discourse here, but also the actions of the political uh, representatives are placing a high concern on the newly arrived migrants. Um, the media is only not depicting them as newcomers who are bringing a quote unquote different type of Islam, but there was also newspaper articles describing them as people who are threatening our democracy and bringing um, or, and are coming to cover our women. Um, but also in May 2020, um, the military was actually deployed to ensure that the migrants in camps were not posing a threat to the local population, although there were no significant incidents to indicate that that was the case. Um, and the second factor is um, that of foreign fighters. So a number of people from Serbia, and this is predominantly from the Sanjak region, although there have been cases from the rest of the country as well, um, people have traveled to Syria and to Iraq to fight alongside ISIS or other groups such as al-Nusra. Um, many have died, some have returned, um, of some of them families have returned while they had stayed. But the importance here is that during this period, um, many people um, were indicted on terrorism charges, in this case seven, and what has happened out of those seven, five were from the Sanjak region. And this has really had a significantly negative impact on the position uh, the general population of Muslims in the Serbian population. So present day, uh, there are some things that echo from the previous two uh, presentations. The first is actually um, the financial hardships that the Islamic populations and the Islamic communities specifically are experiencing. So the Islamic communities, they actually share only 2% of the state budget given to religious communities. You can imagine that the largest portion is going to the Serbian Orthodox Church. Um, and they mainly rely on voluntary donations, which are not enough to keep their activities going and significantly um, limit the reach and the quality of their activities, which is a contributing factor to perhaps why there is no Muslim Brotherhood. Um, the second factor is actually that the proselytization is occurring um, mainly within the Muslim communities. And this is where some of the more extremist groups come into play. 
um, it's occurring inwards rather than outwards towards the general population that includes also the non-Muslim population. And the groups with the more fundamentalist reading of Islam are focused on shaping others and converting them into becoming of what they see as a better Muslim. Um, there is also another um, set of external factors that shapes the Serbia context. Um, again, the previously mentioned extremist groups, um, they are present, they're smaller, and majority of them are peaceful members of the society. However, there have been some that have shown both violent behavior and rhetoric, and these mainly fall under the Wahhabi Salafi currents that are also visible outside of the two Muslim-dominated regions, so in larger cities, such as Belgrade, Novi Sad, Smederevo, Kragujevac, and this is because they tend to mar uh, they tend to target the marginalized Roma populations to convert, um, but also the influence of Turkey. The influence of Turkey in Serbia is significant. It is systematic. Uh, it's, it is institutionalized, and Turkey holds a rather paternalistic approach to the Western Balkans in general and Serbia due to historical connections. The interesting factor here is that Turkey is not the only larger external player. There is also influences from Arab countries that, uh, such as Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. Um, however, their influence is far more overt and is based on individual investments and connections. And this is very difficult to track because at the end of the day, it comes down to following the finances. And these are not particularly transparent um, processes. So as a final point, I would like to share some of the conclusions um, from the Serbia case, and I'll leave them here on the slide. I would like to thank you all for your attention, and if you have any questions and points that you would like me to elaborate on, I am all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea.